couple of weeks ago, we began this series, Exodus, with, a, with this overarching kind of idea that before you decide what you want to do, you must first determine who you want to be. And this is where Moses found himself early on in the story. Early on in the story of, of, of Moses and the Exodus, here was this guy who was an Israelite who was raised in this Egyptian home who was having an identity crisis. And one day he sees his people uh, being tormented and ends up killing an Egyptian and his heart just stirs to help his people. And he doesn't know how to respond to that. And so he's exiled into the desert for a while and scripture tells us for a long period of time he tended some sheep, sat on a rock with a stick out in the middle of the desert watching some sheep. And, <clears throat> but here's the idea that if we just do things in life and not know who we want to be, we're going to drift and we're going to become people that we don't want to be. But if we begin with the idea of this is who I want to be, what we do is very easy. It's very easy for us to determine what to do if we know who we want to be because it's all leading in the same direction. So Moses was struggling with this tension of he knew what he wanted to do, but he didn't know, know who he was yet. And God hadn't really revealed to him his plan yet. And so that's where we began the series. Well, last week, as we continued, Moses had this amazing encounter with a shrubbery. Okay, with this glowing shrubbery in the, in, the, in the side of this mountain, and this shrub wasn't consumed. It was just the presence of God was living in it, and Moses takes off his shoes and, and goes into the presence of God, and they have a conversation, and it's more of an argument, really, than, than a conversation. As God tells Moses, he says, I'm going to deliver my people from the nation of, of Egypt. I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver them and give them the promised land, but I'm sending you. And so what God says in this moment is, I'm going to do this great thing, and I really, really want you to be a part of it. How, how, how great is that? He, he never says he needs Moses or anything, but he just says, I'm going to send you to be my messenger. And so Moses comes up with all these excuses, as you would if you were talking to a glowing bush in the desert. You would have an argument. I would hope you would at least question things along the way, but he does. And, and through the course of this conversation, he comes to understand that with God, it's enough. If it's just me, and God, it's enough. God's going God's to provide. So Moses puts his shoes back on. He accepts the challenge. And he goes back to his father-in-law and he says, Okay, I've, I've got to go back into Egypt. And I want to see if my people are even still alive. I've got to do something about it. So in that moment where God says, I'm sending you, he gets his purpose of who he was designed to be. And so I think a lot of us live in this stress and this tension of kind of where we are. And we feel God kind of stirring maybe in our hearts and our souls. But we're in this long period of time and he hasn't really told us where that's going to manifest itself or how. And we live in this kind of tension just, just like Moses does. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the story where Moses has gone back into Egypt, he and Aaron. And then they begin these conversations with Pharaoh and it leads to these things called plagues and Many of us, I'm guessing, have heard this story before. And so I'm not going to dive exceptionally deep into every one of these plagues. But I cannot encourage you enough to go and read this on your own. <clears throat> just, just go open the book of Exodus. Uh, start in chapter 3 there where Moses comes on the, on the scene. And, and just read through this story. And the, the parallels between Moses being the deliverer and Jesus being the Savior in the New Testament. And Pharaoh's attitudes and our attitudes. There's just so many parallels and such a great story. I cannot encourage you enough to read this story on your own. But I'm just going to kind of highlight and gloss over this so we can get to, to some of the bigger ideas of what's going on. So we pick up the story. <clears throat> Moses has gone back to ask Pharaoh a very ludicrous question. <clears throat> and he and Aaron go back and he says, Okay, Pharaoh, here, here's what, what, what I, I want you to know. <clears throat> I've had a conversation with a shrubbery. <clears throat> And the shrubbery said, for me to tell you to let your entire workforce go. Now, it doesn't take a lot of speculation or assumption on our part to understand how this conversation is going to go. I mean, that's one of the dumbest questions in all of history, right? You're like, no, I'm not letting them go. And we can't, no one would blame Pharaoh for saying, Moses, you're an idiot. I'm not letting my entire workforce for the last 400 years go. I mean, we're talking free labor. They do everything that we tell them, and they're kind of nice, and they leave each other alone, and... We're, we're okay. No, I'm not letting them go. It's a dumb question to ask. And so I started thinking to myself, what would be like a really dumb question that someone's asked me over time or that I would ask someone? And this, this is where my mind drifted, okay? This is just, this will give you a little insight into my weirdness and all this kind of stuff. But a few weeks ago, we had the largest ever, what, mega millions jackpot thing that happened here. And it was like a billion dollars. Some jerk won it and all this kind of, you know. 
<clears throat> and so, in, anyway, oh, we, we love, I'm sure they tithe to their church, so it's great. Um, which is always funny when the mega millions thing goes up, everybody's like, hey, if I win, I'm just gonna tell you, we're gonna pay off the church building. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. <clears throat> but anyway, so here's where I'm, my mind went on this deal. It's like, okay, if I won the deal, I'm, I'm just gonna be upfront and honest. There's something I'm gonna buy. <clears throat> and it's a 67 Shelby GT500. Uh, uh, oh, my people are in the room. And uh, it's Eleanor, you know, for those of you who don't know that, that's, that's my car. It's not some exotic Italian thing. Those are dumb. Okay, but anyway, <clears throat> 67 Mustang GT500, and um, I'm going to ruin it. I'm just going to drive the tires off of it. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, so I'm thinking, I was like, this is the thing I buy, and I buy it quickly, okay, after this happens. I'm just going to let you know. And I'm thinking, what would be dumb? This thing is sitting in my driveway, and my neighbor would come over and say, hey, um, can my 12-year-old drive your car? That's a dumb question. It's like, no, your 12-year-old is not going to drive my car. Now, I will take your 12-year-old on a ride in my car, but no, I'm not going to give my keys to my car to your 12-year-old just because whatever. I, I'm just not going to do it. I was like, that's a dumb question. Now, obviously, that's trivial and it's funny. We all think of really dumb things that people have asked us, but over the course of history, this is, this is a pretty big ask that Moses comes to. And he says, hey, will you, will you give these people to us and let them go? And Pharaoh obviously says no. Well, Moses gets a little distraught because he just thought, well, I'll just go in here and you know, I'm just going to ask. And because God's with me, it's just going to work very smoothly. Well, this is what happens. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 5, this is what God tells Moses after he's kind of distraught when, they, when Pharaoh initially says no. He says, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Now, there's something really powerful about this stretch out my hand phrase, okay? Because the word plague, the, these plagues that are coming, that we know are coming, they don't know are coming yet. The, the word plague, if you translate it, it literally means a strike or a blow. It's like punching someone in the face. It's like an MMA term, a term okay? That's, that's what a plague is. And so what God is saying is, I'm going to punch Egypt in the face. That, that's basically, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome and terrifying at the same time, right? He says, okay, Pharaoh hardens his heart. He says, no, it's a strike. I'm going to strike them. And I'm, I'm going to deliver this, this, this amazing blow to them, and they're not going to be able to recover from it. It's, it's pretty powerful. So, and he says, and they will know that I'm the Lord. How cool is that? So Moses goes back to Pharaoh with this kind of newfound confidence. And he says, okay, here, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you one more time. Will you let them go? And he says, no. So the plagues begin, and they come in waves, and there's basically three kind of sections of these plagues. And like I said, I'm not going to go dive into these deeper. You can do that on your own in Scripture, and I highly encourage you to do that. But these first three plagues that come, they're just kind of stressful, and they're kind of a menace. Okay? They're, they're, they're kind of stressful, they're kind of a menace, and they're kind of harassing to people. Okay? The first one is, they come in, and, they, and, and God turns the Nile River into blood. He turns the water in the Nile River into blood. Now... Pharaoh had some magicians that could do a trick that looked similar to this, and so he wasn't that impressed, and he said no. But you just think of all the, the implications of the, the main water source turning to blood. I mean, fish are going to die, which is a source of income. Transportation up and down the river would stop. Uh, the source of drinking water, uh, just the smell and the nastiness of having all that. It's just kind of an in inconvenience. There were other sources of water and things. They could get by, but that was their primary source, and so it was an inconvenience to them. But still, Pharaoh says no. His heart is hardened. Scripture says. And so he tells Moses, no, I'm still not going to let my people go. That's not that big of a deal. My magicians can do something like that. So Moses comes back and he says, okay, blood in the water didn't work. How about frogs? So frogs come. Now, I grew up in the Midwest and you kind of hunt frogs sometimes. Or at night, you would hear bullfrogs and it's a great sound. It's this great soothing sound. A lot of like white noise machines have this kind of Midwestern kind of deal. And you hear these bullfrogs and it's kind of neat, but I don't want them in my bed with me. Okay, I don't want, I don't want them in my house. If they're down by the pond, that's great. I don't want them near me and all this kind of stuff. But can you imagine every time you walk outside, you have to sweep frogs off the sidewalk and they're jumping all over everything and they're just in the midst of everything. Every time you open the, the closet or the cupboard or a drawer or anything, frogs everywhere, horrible. Moses goes back to, to Pharaoh. Say, hey, you gonna let my people go now? He's like, no, nope, it's not gonna do it. You know why? Because the Egyptians at the time worshiped over 80 gods. 80 gods. They had a god for the sun, the moon, the stars, the Nile River, the livestock, the crops, everything. Everything that you would worry about, they created a god for. So think about that. Everything that you worry about, 
Everything that you stress out about, it's like, man, this, this thing causes me stress. Okay, so we're going to create a God for this, and then we're going to pray for, to this God to relieve this. So they just created all these gods. And so Pharaoh just kept saying, I've got 80 gods, Moses. Surely one of my 80 is more powerful than your one. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let this happen. So Moses is like, okay, frogs don't do it. How about gnats? Just those pestilent gnats in your face all the time, so many that they block out the sun. Can you imagine that? You can't breathe, you can't go outside. So it's just a hassle, it's just a nuisance of things going on. Now, one of the really neat and interesting and frustrating things about the scripture is we're not told how long these things last. I would love to know. It's like, you know, the Nile turned to blood for 30 days. or whatever. We don't know how long it lasts. It could have been days, months, weeks. We don't know. Exactly, but just for this long period of time or this, this time where it's big and irritating enough, all these things are happening. So we have this blood thing that happens, we have frogs that happen, we have gnats that happen. But still Pharaoh says, nope, my gods are more powerful than your God. So the next three, they get a little more painful and they get a little more costly. The, the stakes go up. And I think this is a great principle for us to learn. That the longer that Pharaoh resists God, the more difficult his life gets. I'm just saying I'm just saying, that may or may not apply to us as well, okay? The longer we resist God, the more difficult life gets. And, and so God's like, okay, you know, I kind of gave you a little jab earlier, trying to feel things out. Okay, now I'm going to hit you a little harder. And so what comes next? Flies. Now, for those of us who live like kind of the far west valley, we know we're kind of dealing with some flies right now. They're everywhere. It's horrible. Okay, and we buy these little bags of things. You fill them with water and shake them out and hang them out in the back patio. And for some reason, flies think they're like the four seasons and they've, fly in this thing and they die and it's great and you throw it away and all this. But they're awful, okay? Now, is there, is there anything worse than like being asleep and a fly goes into your ear or your nose? Has, any, has this happened to anyone else? In, in that moment, you have never been more awake or more angry, okay? Because you go from like sleep to DEFCON 5 in half a second and you just want to kill something in that moment. It doesn't even have to be that fly. Something's going to die right now. I've, I've never been so mad. But can you imagine not even being able to move because flies are so bad and they're, they're just everywhere. It's just this pestilence. Moses goes back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, nope, still, still not going to handle that. We've got a God. We'll pray to him. We'll take care of that. So Moses says, okay, we're going to start to destroy the livestock now. Livestock's going to start to die. Now this is when the economy starts to really be affected. Now, flies are going to destroy things, and they're going to bring about some disease, and it's going to be messy and all this kind of stuff. But when the food source starts to die, and you haven't been preparing for this, people get a little irritated. Okay, you start messing with their groceries, and people start getting mad, okay? And so here's, here's what happens. The cows, the sheep, the lambs, the horses, they'll all start to die. And so the, the economic structure and the economy starts to collapse, and people get, start to get hungry. So Moses comes back to Pharaoh and says, how about now? Pharaoh's like, nope, I got, some, you know, I got some stuff in the freezer. We're okay. We're okay. I'm, I'm prepared, and it, it's all right. Okay? Well, next, God sends boils. These little things on your skin that would just be these sores that would, would seep and ooze, and they would be horribly painful. You couldn't sit down. You couldn't lay down. You could never, never, never be comfortable. I know most of us here in Arizona, we, we've had a sunburn at some time that's been so bad that, like, when you put a shirt on, it hurts. But can you imagine your whole body just being covered in these nasty filthy boils and, and you can't cover it. it's just this misery that you just live with all the time and everyone that you deal with is going through these things and so Moses goes back to Pharaoh and says hey what about now Pharaoh's like no no still not gonna we're still not gonna do it still not gonna let him go the longer Pharaoh resists God the more difficult things get now these last four they get a lot more dangerous and they get a lot more destructive okay so Moses says okay boils didn't work how about hailstorms now, a hailstorm in the upper peninsula of the Middle East at this time it would have been a pretty amazing thing to see, but obviously this would have been extremely destructive. I mean, tearing down buildings and, and, and crops and all kinds of just, just utter annihilation of, of things that would happen. They would have no way to be prepared for this. It would just beat everything down. You couldn't go outside. You'd be confined to being inside. Your roof of your house would be being destroyed and all kinds of stuff. Just this pestilence of destruction that would happen. You know, insurance agents from all over the world were colliding on... Egypt at the time and set up their big, you know, hazmat units and all this kind of stuff. Crazy things. FEMA showed up, I'm sure. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, I don't know. Next, Moses goes back and says, hey, what about now? Pharaoh says, no. He says, okay. Next is locusts, these big grasshopper kind of things. So anything that the hailstorm didn't destroy, these locusts would have devoured. 
they would have left everything just down to the ground. So there's nothing left. So, so here you have these people who have gone through all these things, these flies, frogs, blood in the water, livestock dying, all this kind of stuff. They're hungry, they're anxious, they're upset, they're frustrated, and all this kind of stuff. Now every little thing is gone. There's nothing to eat. Everybody's wondering what's going to happen. Pharaoh, how are you going to take care of us? We've been praying to these 80 gods. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. What are we going to do? But still, Pharaoh says no. Scripture tells us his heart was still hardened. hardened. So, so what comes next? God turns off the lights. Darkness. I mean, what's the big deal? What's so dangerous or whatever about darkness? When we, when we think about darkness in the context of what these people are going through, you talk about civil unrest that's going on. There are going to be people rioting in the streets. They're going to be people stealing from their neighbors, anything they can get their hands on to eat or, or that might find any kind of relief. And so the darkness just would, would enhance that. I mean, you're, you're having to walk around with a torch every, every night, walking around the corner, whenever somebody's going to jump out and attack you and take everything you had and try, try to break into your house. And it was just this horrible thing. We all know that these major crimes and things like that happen at night in the dark hours. And, and it's like this consistently for a long period of time. People are just living in terror and fear. Still, Pharaoh says no. He says no. So finally... Moses comes back and he says, okay, Pharaoh, now the firstborn son of everything is going to die. Firstborn son is going to die. And what happens here in this strike that God does, it, it, it's, it's fatal because it destroys the future of a nation. When all of the heirs are taken out, all of the firstborn, all the heirs to the kingdom, all the heirs of every household are taken out, this nation is destroyed for, for generations. For generations. Remember, the longer that Pharaoh resisted God, the more difficult his life got. But this is one that finally breaks him. When Pharaoh sees his son die and he knows that his heir apparent is, is, is dead and, and all this, he, he, he finally says, Enough. It, it, it's, it's enough. I, 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 can't, I can't do this anymore. But God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 12, He, he says, you know, against all of the gods of Egypt, and it's so important to know that in Scripture that's a small G God. It's not a capital G. There's only one capital G God, but all these small G gods, he goes, I will attack them, and I will execute my judgment. And then he says, for I am the Lord. They may have 80 gods, but I'm the one God. I'm the one. That's what he tells Moses and gives Moses his confidence in, in Exodus 12. And so finally, Pharaoh's had enough. And this is what he says in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 31. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go. And then he says these amazing words. And also bless me. Are you kidding, dude? Are you kidding? The nerve of this guy, right? And what he does in this moment is he, he acknowledges that there may be a possibility that Moses' God is greater than all of his gods. But it's an afterthought. And a, a lot of us, we sit here and we, we judge Pharaoh on this and we're like, man, if I would have seen all that stuff that God had done and all this kind of stuff, I would have been, been completely different. Probably not. We probably wouldn't. Because how many times in our own lives do we resist God and our lives get more difficult time and time and time and time again? Or what we do is we go about our plans and we say, God, this is what I'm going to do today. God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this today. This, this is where I'm going to go to school. This is who I'm going to marry. This is where I'm going to live. This is what my career path is going to be. And then we say, oh, and bless me also. We do that. We do it backwards. We go about our own business and we try to go about our own ways and then we say, oh, oh God, by the way, bless me. When God says, you need to start with me. You need to start with me. You don't want the scraps at the end of the day or at the end of the table. You, you want what's best at the start. And this is what, what I believe this shows us here is that God shows us his power so that we will trust in him wherever we are. Wherever we are, in the midst of being in slavery in Egypt, these Israelite people saw God's power work. And in the midst of being in slavery, they began to trust God at a different level for a time being. You know, and Pharaoh, who sits here and he watches this stuff happen, he still doesn't trust God. But here's what I want to encourage you. What, 
what, what's brought you to this place today? What, what, what's, what's God done in your life? When you can look back and say, man, I, I can see where God's protected me. I can see where God's worked. God does that so that we can trust in him right now and have confidence for what he's going to do in the future. And when we, we live with this idea that we can trust in God's power, our lives change. And so this is where I want to spend the rest of our time is on this question. How would you live your life differently if you really believed that God's power was at work in your life? If you really believed it, this power, this hand that stretched out over the nation of Egypt, the power that was in that hand is available to you. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and atoned for our sins is available to you. How would our lives be different if we really believed that? Well, here's how it works. You think, well, is that power? How, how do I get that power? What, what, what does it work like? How, how, how does this happen? Well, Scripture tells us when we choose to follow Jesus Christ and we accept Him and we submit to Him in baptism, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that was at work in the nation of Egypt. The Holy Spirit that was at work in that tomb that Jesus was buried in is available to you. That hand that struck that blow, that punched Egypt in the face, is available to you. How cool is that? Now, how would our lives be different if we really believed that we had access to that power or that we lived with that power working in us? I would say this. How much more bold would you be in sharing your faith if you really believe that God's power was at work in your life? Would you be nervous and upset and really have, have a lot of tension about having a conversation with a coworker because of what the HR department might think? Probably not. Would you have more confidence to go across the street to your neighbor or to have a difficult conversation with a family member? How much more bold would you be if you really believed that? If we lived in, in, in knowing that God's power is actively at work, just like it was then, it is now. How much more would you risk? Would you be more willing to risk things in your life? I, I think we would. Well, I think this is the way it plays out. This is what this ultimately leads to. Us living with the reality of the power of God inside of us, God is counting on it. You know why? Because you are God's plan for reaching lost people. You're it. It's the church. And you're here today, you're, you're part of the church. The church is God's answer to, to the a hurting world to reach lost people. It's us. And the only way that we're going to do that is we live knowing that God's power can be alive and well in us. Just like we talked about last week. With us and God, it's enough. So here, here's what I'm going to ask you. How do you trust God or really live in this power of God working in your life in the area of your family? How do you deal with it with, with your kids and family? If you really believe that God's power is available to you, and you really believe that you're God's plan for reaching lost, how do you deal with your, your, your family differently? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Do you always just pray that your kids will be safe? Or do you pray that your kids will be fierce? There's a difference in those prayers. When we pray that all the time just for our kids to be safe, we're asking God to just protect whatever it is they do. But when we pray for our kids to be fierce, we release them and say, God, do with them what you will. And there's this amazing difference in mindset. And, and for us to say, God, let my children be fierce, we have to rely on God's power at work. We have to. We have to trust in it. So would, would, you, would you handle your kids differently? Or how about those of you who have a prodigal? You, you, have, you have a child or, or maybe a sibling or whatever that's in rebellion. And they're just off the rails. And you're worried and you're concerned about them. Do you really believe that God's power can bring them back? Do you really believe that God's power can restore them? Do you live with that confidence? It may be a long period of time. But do you live knowing that God's power is at work and it's available? And how do you tap into that? Or, or maybe how do you handle difficult family situations? The next six weeks of the year are the most stressful and tension-filled for families because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know why? Because we're together. Okay? That's why. We're all in the same room together. There's tension. You know why there's tension? Some people like lumps in the mashed potatoes. Some people don't want lumps in the mashed potatoes. Some people like pecan pie. Some people like pumpkin pie. Okay? And it's pecan, not pecan. Okay? Just, by the way, it's pecan. Okay? Anyway, 
And there's some of you, see, some of you will not remember anything else I say. Okay? It's in the Bible. It's pecan. Okay? It's pecan. It's in the Greek. Pecan. Okay? And then there's some of you that struggle. He's like, well, are you going to invite Cousin Ellie to Thanksgiving? She's nuts. If you invite Cousin Ellie, I'm not coming. Well, I'm not coming if you, invite, if you don't invite her. And so there's this tension all the time because we're together. So how, do we pray, God, just get me through this day? Or do we pray, God, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen today, but man, spark something in me that can be a catalyst for change. Help, help me help Cousin Ellie. You know, whatever. Do we pray with those things in our hearts? If we really believe that God's power is available to us, we would change the way we, we look at those, the outlook of those things. We, we really would. How about your job? How would your job be different? Can you imagine making a job decision that wasn't based on financial gain or climbing the corporate ladder? Most of us take jobs because, oh, this is, this is a great move for me and for my career, and it's a promotion, I'm going to do that. Or, hey, there's significantly more money if I get into this field or whatever. And we make decisions based on that. When our decisions should be, God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? See, there's, there's a huge mindset that, that happens here. And you remember, the longer that Pharaoh resisted God, the more difficult his life got. The longer he resisted, the more difficult it got. What about your relationships? What about when it comes to choosing a spouse? I mean, I know there, there are some of you who are single here, and you, you've been praying for a spouse for a long time. You've had a horrible relationship, and maybe you've been divorced, and you, the idea of a relationship or moving forward with someone in the future is just not even on your radar or whatever right now, and that's great. That, that, it, it is what it is, I and mean, it's great. But do you pray, God, who, who is it that you would have me spend my life with? Or do you just say, well, I'm attracted to her, and she's attracted to me. We've got a lot of things in common. Hey, we're going to give it a try. There's a big difference in the way that we handle those things. How about restoring a relationship? Do you believe that God can restore relationships? Now, some of the relationships, we, we all have them in this room. We have relationships that have been damaged, and they're, they're, they're painful, and they're, 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 they're bad. Okay, But are they the best they can be? Are we doing everything to make them as best as they can possibly be? If we believed that the power of God was really alive and active and working in us, I think we would work towards those things. There are some of us in this room right now that we're in some unhealthy relationships. And I'm not just talking about like with a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. We have just people in our life that are unhealthy. And, and, and you need to let go of those things. But it's painful to let go of those things. And you would rather live in the pain and the familiarity of that hurtful relationship than to go through the pain of change to get healthy. But if we believe that God's really active and working in our life, we should be like, okay, God, you've got this. I know it's going to be painful for a season. I know it's going to be maybe a long period of time. It's going to be difficult for a little while. But I believe that you've got something better for me. Because remember, we talked about this principle the other day, that, that God doesn't just take us to a different place. He leads us to a better place if we'll let him do it every time. And this is the thing that Pharaoh kept missing, time time and time again. How would the area of your finances be different if you really believed that God was alive and working? I, I guarantee you'd be more generous. We'd be more giving. We, our decision making would be different. You know, and the things that we buy and purchase and all this kind of stuff. I've already confessed, if I won the Mega Millions, I'm buying a 67 GT500. Okay, but this is after I give money. Okay, obviously it's going to happen, happen. Okay, but I mean, we, we think about we, we spend money differently. Okay, we, we, we do that. And I'm not talking about you grind on everything. It's like, okay, God, do I buy the blue car or the white car? And he doesn't care about that. But I mean, we started making decisions based on, well, maybe I should buy this used car and instead of the new car because it's a better investment and I have more money, I have more margin than in my life. And things, are, things will be a little easier. And I can be more generous and I can do more things if I do. We start to think differently. It's just, oh, no, it's the bright, shiny one. God, I'm going to buy this car. Oh, and bless me also. See, it's different when we, when we do those things. I can tell you that your life will be different if you really live that out. And you know what else would be different? Our church would be different. If we really lived with this belief system and, and, it, and it permeated who we are, it would be different. We would pray differently. We would pray differently. I, I guarantee you, we would pray more and we would pray differently. You would fervently pray for the leadership, the staff, volunteers, people who come into this church. You'd pray for this church all the time. And I know there are some of you that do that, but more of us would if we really lived believing that the power of God is available and I'm, we're going we're to attack this with God's power. 
we're going to pray for our church and our, our, our leaders would make good decisions and wise decisions and that this would be a place where lost people who are far from God would, would come to, to be comfortable and, and grow and in this journey with him and what it looks like and eternal addresses would be changed and we really believe that and that God can work in that and we would pray for those things. Serving in the church would be different. We'd have waiting lists for people to serve. We've got so many, we've got to put you on a waiting list. Now that means we've got to create more things. It's good. But we would be, there would be no shortage of any of those kind of things. Also with your verbal support and encouragement. And this is where I think this self-absorbed consumerism, Christianity comes in to a lot of us. And we, we come into this place, and, and we all do it. We, we walk into a place, and we, we hear this all the time. He's like, well, we, we walked in, but man, it was really hot in the worship center. And then two minutes later, somebody says, it was really cold in the worship center today. And then it's like, well, I, I, I think the music's too loud. And then somebody says, well, I think it's too soft. I think you need to turn the music up. And then somebody says, well, I think that I, I don't really like it when this person leads worship, or I don't like it when this guy teaches, I don't like it when, when this happens, and, and I don't like this, and nobody said hello to me by the time I got to this spot, and nobody did this, and it's just, it's all about me. And so many times what we do, then we leave, and we say, well, that was a bad experience, or, you know, it was just, I wasn't fed today, and all this kind of stuff. That's bogus. Bogus. Well, our prayer should be, okay, God, I'm going to go today, and wherever you choose to go to worship, I'm going to choose to worship because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to lift high the name of God and I'm going to join with a, a group of people and I'm, I, I, want to be, I, want to be, I want to experience God's presence. And I, I want to learn something. I want to be filled with something. And I want to be a blessing to maybe somebody that I come in contact with. That's what our prayer should be instead of God just impress me today. And by the way, I'm going to go today, so you should be really glad I'm going to be there. And a lot of us do that. We're like, God, you know, I haven't been here in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to go today and you're lucky. A lot of us think that. We really do. But we would live differently if we really believed that the power of God was working in us. When we prayed about going to church, we'd say, okay, God, I don't know who's going to speak today. I don't know who's going to lead worship. It doesn't matter. I'm going to choose to worship you. I'm going to lift your name high. Let me be a blessing to someone today that I interact with. Let me, if, maybe I meet someone who's hurting and lost. And whatever. Just let me be an encouragement to them. And God, if there's a place where I can serve, or give, I, I pray that. See, there's a, a mind shift that happens when we really believe that the power of God is alive and active and available to us. You know what? Our world would be different also. Not just our, our personal lives and our church. Our world would be completely different. Do you know what our world is starving for? Our world is starving for a group of people who call themselves Christ followers to live a seven-day-a-week faith. That's what it is. That's what our world needs more than anything. And they are desperately watching us and they are desperately waiting for people who call themselves Christ followers to act like Jesus Monday through Friday and not just on Sunday morning. Because many of us, what we do is we come in here and we worship and man, it feels good. Man, we had a great experience and we say, oh God, and bless me on the way out. Oh God, oh, oh and bless me. But then Monday through Friday, our coworkers or the people that we interact with, they have no idea that we're a Christ follower. No idea. And guess what? That's not their problem. It's yours. Now, I'm not saying you need to go buy a I love Jesus, ask me how you can know him t-shirt. Okay? I would encourage you not to do that. Okay? Unless you're riding on an airplane because then no one will sit by you. It's awesome. <laughs> okay? <laughs> awesome. So, that's the only example. Okay? But I, what, what I'm saying is this. They're dying. Their eternity, all, we have the opportunity to eternally change their addresses. They're dying. And we don't live consistently all week. There will be people probably at your work that would be shocked. You know, you go to church and they would say, you know, you're going to die one day. And they're going to say, hey, the funeral's going to be at Refinery Christian Church. And that's their church. That person went to church? You mean there was a church that let them in? Right? Some of these conversations are real. What would it look like if we lived our Monday through Friday life really expecting the power of God to be available to us? Our lives and our world would be completely different. This is what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. When we live out this power of God, of trusting God, 
No matter where we are. We look back and we see how God's work worked and we take confidence in that. And we know that he's going to work in the now and we expect him to work in the future. When we live with this as one of our core beliefs, it is beautiful to people who are far from God. It's beautiful. It's what the church is designed to do. And we're the church. Over the course of these last, this last year really, it's been a really reflective time for me. And many of you here know in my story and a lot of things that happened to me earlier in the year health-wise and spending a ridiculous amount of time in the hospital and have fighting a lung disease now and all these kind of things. And so those things have been one, one thing that we've dealt with this year. We also dealt with a, a close family friend who's going through personal crisis that Melissa and I have had to lean into very, very, very heavily. All of our kids moved out. We're empty nesters now. And so that, that happened. And oh, by the way, we're building a new church building. All these things have happened in, in 2018. And so some people will say, how are you upright? And it's like, well, God's got this no matter what. And I've had this opportunity to look back and I see how God's provided time and time and time again. And so let me just rejoice and be thankful over that. But it's also giving me this amazing presence of what's going on right now, to enjoy right now of what's happening and a confidence that God's not going to take us somewhere where he's going to leave us. But it's also left me ex- extremely expectant for what's going to happen in the future. I have no reason to doubt that God's going to stop doing anything amazing. I have no reason to doubt that whatsoever. And as, as we move forward, we're going to walk forward in that confidence of, of what that looks like. And when we do, it's beautiful, the people who are far from God. And that's our challenge. That's our challenge, is to trust God wherever we are and not be Pharaoh, not just say, okay, we're going to make our own plans and we're going to do our own thing and then, oh, by the way, God bless me. We all look at that and we say, that's so foolish. Why would you do that? But yet we do it time and time again. We've got to begin with God, we're yours and we trust in your power and that power that's available to us, we want to unleash it. We want to unleash it and see what happens and we trust that you're going to be faithful in that. Let's pray together. God, we love you and we say thanks for the way that you work in so many ways. We thank you for the opportunity to to know your son, Jesus. And we thank you for what he did on the cross that gives us the ability to connect to you. And God, right now, we just say we're sorry for when we've acted like Pharaoh. We've seen you work, but we've denied your power. We say our ways are better. Even through the misery and the pain, we, we still think our ways are better. But just like for Pharaoh, the longer we deny you, the worse things get. So just give us the wisdom and the courage to choose to follow you above everything else. In Jesus' name.